As September begins, so does another college football season. Hello and welcome to yet another year of the Grizzly Sports Report. I'm your host, Dominic Sheldon. ABC Montana Sports with Dominic Sheldon. Yesterday, the Lady Grizz of Montana took on the eight-seeded Idaho State Bengals and barely escaped with a last-minute victory. Today, the Montana men's team taking on a very dangerous eight-seeded Weber State team. Of course, tomorrow, the biggest football game in the state of Montana, the Brawl of the Wild, happening. But each year before the Brawl of the Wild on Friday night, it's the state double-A title game. This year, it pits two great teams together. It's a matchup between a high-scoring offense in the Bobcats and the conference's best defense in Montana. So, will the Bobcat offense score less than 28 points, which is less than their season average. At some point, we all fall down, but it's how we get back up that really shows our true character. We got into Spokane about an hour ago, then headed over to Cheney, where the conditions aren't exactly perfect. It's about 29 degrees, and as you can see behind me, very, very foggy. Hopefully, it clears up a little bit before game time tomorrow. As far as the game itself, Hey everyone and welcome to Sacramento, California. I promise, I know you can't see because it's so dark outside, but we are on the Sacramento State Field. So let's see what Montana thought. We polled our viewers online. This one may be a little bit surprising. Jordan Johnson, the senior, beaten by the sophomore Dakota Prukop. College Insider announced you were the sexiest man in college basketball. Your thoughts and more importantly, your wife's thoughts on the uh, prestigious honor. Jasmine Thomas has been consistent the entire season. If they're going to get out of that rut, it's largely in part to her. You see there the nice hook shot in the lane. She's got a quick release from the post. She also shoots a very high percentage, averaging just shy of 20 points on the entire season. And then for the Grizzlies, it's score more than 60. Sounds simple on paper. Every game they've lost, they've scored 60 or less. So basically, they score more than 60, they win. A very balanced starting lineup for the Grizzlies. Mario Dunn in his second season as starting point guard. Jordan Gregory a little bit slow out of the gate this season, but a guy who can put up a lot of points is a tremendous shooter. Adds a little insult to injury. Coach Fish is not happy. Goes right to Norman after that one. That's a shot you absolutely cannot miss. On today's show, we talk with Grizz head coach Mick Delaney, junior linebacker Kendrick Van Akron, and we feature the tight ends and mic up their coach Ross Brunel. But before we get there, we'll take a look back at the Grizz season opener at the University of Wyoming. For you, you got to wear that 37 jersey your senior year. A lot of accolades, several school records broken. And I know it's probably tough to do, but can you put into words what the University of Montana has been like for you? Man. Surreal. <laughs> Coach, first season at Montana, back from the playing days, a conference championship. How, how surreal is it to be in this position? It's amazing. It's amazing. It's been a long road. You almost retired one time and then came back to be the head coach. If you look back, uh, why was coming back, despite an original retirement, to be the head coach here for three years the right decision? Man, uh, probably it was the right thing to do at the right time. And I don't know if you know this stat, but you guys are currently part of the longest win streak against MSU since World War II. Sure. You won't play that again. So you did not lose to Montana State during your career. So what does that mean to you? I know you're not a, a Montana guy, but how big of a deal is that? It's big. I mean, uh, just for our, for our city and our fans, um, you know, I'm not from here, but um, right when I got on campus, right when I got to Missoula, I knew, uh, and I came to realize how important the rivalry was. With every home run swing or every fastball strikeout, the conversation often turns to steroids. And with the recent suspensions because of a link to biogenesis, it leaves minor league ball players realizing many of the major leaguers they looked up to as kids have cheated. It's, it's very frustrating. I mean, it, it's, it's like they, they have no respect for the game. For many players in the minor league system today, steroids are something they were well aware of as kids, but many aren't aware of how things like hormones, blood pressure or even liver functioning can be affected when the drugs are abused. You know, that's one thing that they don't quite put two and two together. They see the short-term gains, but they don't see how it's going to affect them kind of further down the line. The long-term dangers of anabolic steroids and other PEDs are what clubs try to teach their young players. However, it is hard to deny their short-term impact. Just a little bit more edge, putting something in your body and the ball's going 20 feet further just makes a difference. I mean, those guys, you could tell how huge they were. For this year's Diamondbacks rookie class, their education on Major League Baseball's banned substances began quickly. We had a couple meetings about that as soon as we got on to uh, 
the Diamondbacks complex. Banned substances can be found in supplements sold at grocery stores and gyms across the country. So to make things easier on the athletes, they're told to only use products that are certified by NSF for sport and application they can download to their PC or smartphone. We have a running joke with the team, you know, if we see somebody eating a turkey sandwich, we ask them if it's NSF approved, you know. I've had a bunch of guys come up to me and and ask me if, hey, is this, is this stuff okay? And that's when you know that, that what we're doing was working because they're thinking about it and, and they're making sure that what they're doing is right. While the road to the majors is a difficult one for any young ball player, many of them truly respect baseball and are confident the integrity of the game still exists. Guys that do respect the game and do care about it, you know, they do it the right way. While doing the right thing may be enough for some players, the training and strength staff hopes the realization of the dangers of performance enhancing drug use is enough to keep everyone clean. You know, who wants to, who wants to die at 60 because, or even 50, 40, whatever, because so they can make 25, what's, what's 30 million when you're dead? The origins of traditional polo aren't quite agreed upon. However, one thing that is acknowledged is the game was formalized and popularized by the British, a sport now often viewed as very high society. And in Montana, cowboy polo has also been around for decades, and it's a little bit different. Uh, it's been described as like rugby on horseback. Uh, it's You get a few bruises and stuff, but at the same time, people are very cautious not to hurt a horse. Um, and generally not to hurt players either. It may be referred to as rugby on horseback, but it is a family-friendly event. You know, guys show up, they've got a girlfriend and she wants to play too, and pretty soon you know, it's, it's kind of a couple's thing, and it's, it's really fun because you can go out there and, and beat up on your husband a little bit, and, and it's all, but it's all in good fun. It certainly gets competitive, and there is plenty of contact, so just how do they keep those horses safe? There's rules designed so that uh, you can't run head-on into other horses or run into them in a T-bone type of fashion. Uh, you have to be side by side with each other, jockeying for the ball. Not only do you have to ride your horse and change directions quickly, there's that rubber ball in the middle of the arena that is more commonly seen when playing dodgeball. You'd think that it'd be really easy to hit that, that playground ball out there, but when you're riding full bore and turning and spinning and trying to hit the ball, it actually is, is harder than it looks. For the cops, their nine-year-old daughter, Brayden, isn't allowed to play until she turns 12, but she's more than ready when her time comes. Because I think it's just fun to get to hit the ball around and um, play against other people. I get a practice with our polo team when we're at practice, but I don't get a play yet. And when you ask Brayden how she fares against her parents and the rest of the adults, she's pretty modest. Sometimes they go a little easy on me, but sometimes they just let me have and make a goal. But usually I'm down on the end playing by myself. This week, our ABC All-Stars come to us from Big Sky High School, a group of softball players who have gotten back up and have written a pretty impressive story of redemption. After tearing through the state double-A tournament without a loss, Big Sky faced Billings West in the state title game. Late with it all tied, the unthinkable happened. After a strikeout got away, the runner came all the way around the bases to score, meaning a big sky loss. It was one of those deals you're sitting there, the coaches are sitting there going, I, I just can't believe what I'm seeing here. It's, you know, and, and this, we have played so well the entire tournament. To have something like that happen in that thing was pretty devastating. After it all was said and done, it was bittersweet because we knew that we did so good and passed everybody's expectations for what we had but the way it ended was, it was terrible. Everyone just saw that one play, which was a bad play. So it was really important that we shook it off and like just carried on with everything. Well, the team kept an impressive outlook on their second place finish. All right, number one, Billings West against Big Sky in softball. It wasn't long until the unique ending made its way to the number one play on SportsCenter. Oh gosh, that was embarrassing. We were reading like, we were sitting in class and I remember kids like reading comments on Twitter and you're just like, holy cow, that's, ooh. <laughs> I thought it was pretty cool for Kendall at least. I mean, she struck the girl out, she looked pretty good. But other than that, I was kind of embarrassed by it. I think our whole team was kind of embarrassed by it. We had to work really hard to get to that point. So it's just a bummer that that's how everyone remembers like our season, I guess. But the team kept up their positive attitude and a core group of them have played on the Zootown All-Stars Little League team. 
the one that earlier this week beat Southern California to punch their ticket to the Little League World Series in Delaware. It's crazy to think that we're going to that. Like, um, just every game that we play is going to be like a championship game. Um, they're going to be good teams all around, and we just have to work hard every single time. I can't even, I don't even have words to express how happy and how excited I am for our team and how just unbelievable this experience is going to be. Like, it's crazy. <laughs> it's fantastic. They, they just had a great time. To watch those kids celebrate after that was meant an awful lot because they deserved it. ESPN owns the broadcast rights to the Little League World Series. And while their broadcast schedule isn't known right now, even just the chance to redeem themselves in the national spotlight is something all the girls look forward to. It'll mean so much showing people that, yeah, we made, we made a mistake, but showing people that we're good and we're going to come back. Oh, it'd be awesome. It'd be incredible, I mean, to do something actually worthy of being on ESPN's top plays would be definitely really cool.